recording. Okay. Well, so here's here's a basket clump. Uh, you often see clumps like this, and you can see the different sizes of the trees. And so usually some of them are a good bit younger than the others, so the bark bark thickness and roughness and everything differs within that clump. You can see some on the side over here that are, you know, just one inch of, you know, they would have, you know, usable bark, just strip it off. And then the bigger ones, you might have to soak in the lake or whatever to get get the bark off of it. But anyway, this is characteristic of, of basswood. So, um, so I guess before we talk about the basketry part of this, I just wanted to quickly mention different parts of the tree and how we can get different materials from them. Um, the leaves, uh, every now and then the farmer's market here in town, you'll, they'll, uh, they'll be selling or at least demonstrating the edibility of basswood leaves. Uh, so they taste pretty good when they're young, and then I've read about using big basswood leaves in roasting in fire, you know, cooking fire, so there's some use for the, the leaves. Yeah, these small stems, you know, you can peel the bark off of those. This isn't a good time of year, but you can peel that bark off and use it this time of year. So you got the leaves, and then, um, the flowering part of the tree is interesting. Um, this is the, these are the flowers that are several years old. And if you're ever under a basswood tree at the end of June, early May, if it's a good flower year, it'll just be buzzing with bees and other insects. And there's a honey, really wonderful honey that's made out of basswood honey. There's a couple producers in Minnesota. Um, so if you're interested, you should try it. And uh, let's see. So then, probably the you know the most used and <coughs> is is wood from basswood. And and there's these, there's a shim a factory that manufactures shims over in, in Cohasset, and they used to use uh, I think it was pine. Lodgepole pine from out west, and then they discovered basswood, and so all their shims now are made from basswood, and they're one of the largest producers of shims in the country. And then probably, I think the the nice, a really nice use is the is the carving uh, of all kinds of things. And this plate is uh, there's a woman who uh, lives over in Chisholm, and she's a wood burner. And she, she does wood burning and almost exclusively uses basswoods. So you can see the characteristics of basswood. It's really a light, light wood. And, uh, you know, it makes a paneling. It's, it's really obviously really soft to be able to carve it. You carve it dry like this. You don't even have to carve it when it's wet. So that's, uh, so that's kind of just quickly, you know, some of the other uses of basswood. Parts of the tree, anyway. So about <coughs> about basketry. Um, how do you get the bark? That's where it all starts, I guess. And here's a here's a piece of of basswood outer bark. And what I did was I soaked this for a while, just to give an idea of the layers of bark. It's, it's interesting that the kind of the the structure of the bark kind of changes from the outermost, where it's pretty much solid bark, and as you get closer or further away from that, you get to the in, inner layers of that outer of inner bark, it starts to open up more. I assume that there's some of the living cells die, and but uh, so you've got different qualities of bark within the layer. And uh, 
So, but the, you know, if you, you know, if you take this off the tree, there's basically three. I view three different ways that you can deal with the bark and make it into a a weavable or usable form in terms of basketry. The one way is just to take the bark off the tree and to physically separate it, the inner from the outer bark by hand. So I did that. It was pretty crude, but I did that with this, and I just didn't. It was just all the moisture that was in the in the bark, and I just wove this wove this up. And it's just you know pretty sturdy material. It doesn't it may break, but it's it's not too bad. So that's one way of of using it. The other way that I mostly use is to take this and throw it in the lake for about oh two three weeks four weeks depends on the water temperature and that sort of thing. And it starts basically starts to rot, and the layers separate out, as you can see here. And then you you end up with a big. Depending on how big the tree is, you get a big bundle like this. So it's all these all these different layers together. Um, and then Nate, who's filming this, he takes and. Some here, but he's got a. Uh, he, he takes and cooks this innermost layer. You separate it, right? Just the inner layer, and then he cooks this in a mixture of 50-50 uh, mixture, roughly of hardwood, wood ash, and water. And I don't know. It depends on how long, maybe an hour or two, or some folks. Emily Durkee, who's done a lot of work you've been fooling around with seeing how long you can cook this stuff and what happens to it but Nate claims and I think he's right you know that maybe you get a, a stronger product this way than you do put it in the lake to rot for about a month but uh, they both have their uses and Nate has got a, a net here that he made the net is, is made out of nettle, but the, the rope around the nettle is, I think, twine, basswood inner bark here. Three strand. Three, three strand twine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then I was given years ago, somebody called me up from a, the, one of the museums in the cities and said they had a, they were going to throw away this net. And they told me, and I, I assumed that they were right. That there was a guy that sat and demonstrated making netting for a Viking exhibit down there, and this is this is a basswood, a twined basswood bark net. It's about eight feet long, and two or three feet wide. I think it was just a demonstration. I'm not sure, you know, if they used this that much, but anyway, it looks like something's been chewing on it here. So, so, um, so some of the things, well, the other thing that basswood bark really takes up, uh, dye really, really well. Um, and these are just the uh, writ dyes from the grocery store. And I, I've never tried natural dyes, but I'm sure that would work too. Um, and here, step back a little bit, I, I had a whole bunch of bark one year and I had it in the lake for about three, four weeks, took it out and separated it and there was a, still a lot of a lot of bark left on. So I threw it back in the lake and I left it there for a year. And I, this is what came came of that. And it's still pretty strong. And anyway, just an example of of uh, you know what keeping it in the lake for a long time. I've had uh, a number of folks you know, say, well, gee, I got a wood pile with basswood, you know, and I go out there to split it and I get all kinds of fiber. Can I use that? And, you know, it'd probably be weak, but, you know, if, if somebody's got that kind of fiber, it probably may be worth, worth using like that. 
So anyway, just a little bit less clean color than the other. And so the things, you know, <coughs> I got all kinds of. I mix I mix it up some with with. Uh, that's not a piece of basketball. Anyway, I mix it up sometimes with with other fibers just to change the color and that sort of thing. And then um, you know some other. I'm I, I'm not much of a maker. Mainly what I've done is just uh, just made flat mats like this. This is a braided. This is a braided and then sewn together. This one here. This is also braided and sewn together with uh, some sort of, I don't remember what kind of yarn or whatever it was they used there. This is, I knitted this, I twined a two strand twine and then I knitted, knitted this and I've tried to talk other knitters into using this but they're reluctant to do it. But it's, it's kind of fun, it, you can either twine it and then knit it, or you can just take the fiber like like this, you know, and then as you're knitting, you just kind of give it a twist and knit along. It's probably faster doing that than twining here. And uh, this is just a small basket that Tina Fung Holder teaches. She teaches at North House. This is made out of, of basswood bark. Um, this is a I, this is really a neat stitch. I don't know how to do it, but if you ever get a chance to take her class, it would be a good class to take. And uh, then these are kind of neat here. I, these are from Russia. I found them on the internet. But these are basswood slippers. Uh, there's a, a species of basswood in Europe that's you know identical to our species. It's just a, it has a different scientific or name for it but this is, these are kind of neat and I think this is this was made from material just like this it was just taken off the tree maybe let to dry and then re-wet and woven up like that um, so that's about it I, oh, here's a, here's a large mat here or a larger place mat that was braided and then sewn together. The, you know, this this was done circular. This is just long strips that go back and forth this way, and uh, so that's more basswood. And then, so far as what you can do with basswood, it's it's interesting. This book here um, is from I can't remember where it's from, but it's it's using raffia. Um, and that's a, a fiber from palm trees. But what was interesting, I came across this book on new ways to use raffia, and it was interesting to see the what they say about these other fibers. And that um, says here, um, that raffia, which is just fiber, can also be obtained from many trees, plants, and trees. In early times in Northern Europe, for example, people obtained raffia from linden, which is basswood, and elm trees, where long sinewy fibers lie between the bark and the woody part. When the bark is stripped off, the raffia comes along with it, or after six or eight weeks in the water, you can separate the raffia from the bark. So, so I, I've thought, well, you could use basswood bark to replace raffia. Well, she calls basswood bark raffia, so um, it's a perfect material. And I'm sure there's lots of other books available, but this is really quite a neat book, and I've not unfortunately tried to make anything yet. But there, there are hats like so, and they're all made from braided material. And then there's various. Types of baskets like this, so it's a really versatile material, and uh, I don't think it's all that hard to. Here's one here. Hard. This is a 
this is a stitch like uh, like this this stitch here it looks looks like it so anyway um go on the internet here's a thing i found the other day from uh, outdoor skill school in great britain and they they go through all of the uses of, from, of bark from the basswood or from wood and stuff from the basswood tree and they talk about the leaves and and uh, using it to eat and to bake. Here's, I don't know if you can show this, this is a really good example here of the adult older tree and then it sprouted all these young stems which can be cut and, and used uh, to get the, the inner bark from. So anyway, there's, if, you know, if, uh, you know, if you have any questions, give me a shout, or Emily Durkee at Folk School, she's pretty much in residence there now, and uh, she's doing a lot of work and has done a lot of work with basswood bark, so I'd say get hold of her. And, oh, one other thing, I don't have, have demonstrated, but, but um, making rope. This is a simple little rope machine here, and uh, it's just uh, these four, you can make three strand or four strand, or probably two strand. You just hook it up and run it, run it out and crank it like so. And you gotta have, have it anchored at the other end, and the other end has to spin as well in order to get it. I don't have it set up to do that, but. This is just a, a simple rope machine that you can find. You can make one yourself pretty easily, I'm sure. Um, but uh, rather than doing all this by hand, you can, you know, make take a more substantial piece of material. That's about it. Basswood bark in a minute. Bye bye. Good night.